Beautiful. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, those who are in uh, class physically, and uh, good evening to those who are faithful to watch these things online. Please let me introduce you, Master <laughs> of Theology, Doctor in Theology, in Jewish Studies, <laughs> my excellent husband, devoted father, Francois Bluin. Thank you so Dr. much. <laughs> She has told you the truth. It's done. I will be uh, probably be going in California if it's allowed in uh, July. Um, it was supposed to be in June. They postponed to July. Will they postpone to August? I don't know, but I will keep you posted. So, um, yeah, this is it. Um, I'm at, uh, master's in theology and doctor, uh, doctorate in theology also in Jewish studies more precisely. Beautiful. We carry on until even if we have to go to June, we carry on the class simply because we have already scheduled Isaiah for the month of September. So we'll take it one ch chunk at a time. Tonight, we should be able to do two sessions of 35 to 40, something like that to uh, accelerate the pace a little bit, not going faster, but covering a little bit more. But we, got, we will have to use a few weeks in June. So but not past June. I'm pretty sure that we will be out of Division 10 by then. Why don't we take our silent time together and carry on with uh, what we have been doing? If you see something while I'm praying on the board, <clears throat> you need to note all this. At least draw this exactly like they are. I'm not an expert drawer. I will explain the, the type of crosses later on this evening. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I thank you for your presence among us and within us. I am asking you, Father, to bless us, a small gathering of people here present on Wednesday night, and to bless those also who dedicate that time in their home, offices, and so on, maybe in the car also, watching these things, CDs, and so forth. Bless them where they are at. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that, uh, that we are given to to be able to carry on and to finish it before the September. Allow us a good preparation, me a good preparation for the book of Isaiah to come. It's exciting, Father, to carry on in your word. Open the eyes of our soul again tonight that we may behold wonderful things by the utmost and the prominent and preeminent example of lifestyle on this planet provided by the God-man, Jesus Christ, Father, he came to provide for us an example of life. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Last week, we start right now. I left you with the statement. We are still on paragraph 161. We continue. So I would like to put your finger on your outline on the Arabic number three, the second trial before Pilate. We are on the stage number three right now. We'll finish that and move on to point number four, the mockery. If you visualize your page, basically I would like you to be on page 223 of your Harmony of the Gospel. Extreme right, page 223 at the bottom, where it says, When therefore the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Here. And I left you last week with the statement that uh, <clears throat> if he refused to pass the Roman signed sentence, Pontius Pilate he is the one he has to pass it. Jesus cannot die. And I express also to you that this is from a human perspective, though. Right at that point, we stopped last week here. The Jewish leaders drop the charge of sedition. That's what they do right now. They drop the charge of sedition. And in John 7, they will be going back to what troubles them from the very beginning. Come with me in John 7. Turn to page 225. The Jews, top right, the Jews answered him, Pontius Pilate, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself to be the Son of God. They go back to the issue of blasphemy. Write that down. He made himself to be the Son of God. Basically, you can make in your notes, he claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the Messiah. 
they go back to what has been troubling them from the beginning. Blasphemy and claiming to be God himself. At this point, Pontius Pilate will have a reaction of fear. Because he wonders about Jesus and we have seen many times that he did attempt to release him. With that new charge that he's not too concerned with, but he's wondering, we go to verses 8 to 11. Come with me. When therefore Pilate, when Pilate therefore heard this saying, he was the more afraid. And he entered into the palace again and said unto Jesus, Who are you? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said unto him, Do you speak unto me nothing? Don't you know that I have the power to release you and I have the power to crucify you? Jesus answered Pilate, You would have no power against me, except it were given to you from above. Therefore he that has delivered me unto you has greater sin. Circle has greater sin, please. That was verses 8 to 11. Pilate at this point offered no more answers. No more answers by Jesus. The reason being, most likely, Pilate did receive sufficient spiritual light. So that's why no more light. He answered Jesus with sarcasm when he says last week, what is truth? So when he made that statement, what is truth now? No more spiritual light is given to Pontius Pilate. Then Pilate in verse 10 speaks about the authority. Don't you know that I have the power to crucify you or to release you? Jesus in verse 11 reminds Pilate that the, the, the authority that he has is only delegated authority. It's not the authority of the Father. Pilate has authority, but it's only delegated. The final word is from the Father. The one that is in control above concerning the crucifixion of Jesus is the Father. I have watched a few things very briefly on, um, how do you call it, that thing? Facebook. Facebook. And the one that is real, in real control of this situation is the Father. He is in control. In verse 11, at the end, it says, The one that delivers me unto you has greater sin. Make a note of this for your own sake. There are degrees of sin. There are degrees of sin. Because I don't want you to go around sometimes to say sin is sin and all sins are the same. Not at all. Under the Mosaic law, there was various kinds of punishment for sins. Because there are, there are a variety of sins. Degrees of sin. And that is exactly why we will have degrees of punishment in the lake of fire. Some will suffer more than others in the lake of fire. Some will suffer more than others in the lake of fire, and there are degrees of sin, and that's exactly why we need the great white throne judgment to judge the people based upon their sins, not you and I. The great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20. The great white throne judgment is a judgment unto which you don't partake. You do partake into the judgment seat of Christ, but you do not partake into the great white throne judgment. This is a judgment only for unbelievers to determine their degree of punishment in the lake. 
Come with me, beloved, in verse 12. Upon this, Pilate sought to release him. Circle sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Circle, you are not Caesar's friend. This is the fifth attempt to release the Messiah. This is the fifth attempt to release the Messiah. This is the fifth attempt to release the Messiah, and that also will be spoiled by the next statement. We have no king but Caesar. You're not Caesar's friends. making himself a king, speak against Caesar. So that's why he says, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friends. We just read the, the, the verse, you will get it here. Jesus cried out saying, if you release this man, Jesus, you're not a friend of Caesar. That's it, absolutely. Okay, look, look at the reaction of Pontius Pilate right now, verse 13, go there. Everyone that makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. That's what the Jew says. When Pilate, therefore, circled the word, therefore, heard these words, circle heard these words, what they just say, he brought Jesus out, sat down at the judgment seat at the place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation of the Passover, and it was the sixth hour, and he said unto the Jews, you circle, behold your king. When they said it, when they said in verse 12, if you release this man, you are not a friend of Caesar, that's enough to intimidate Caesar. Make your note, I will go slow now, because I need to tell you what's going on here. The statement is enough to intimidate Caesar. Enough to the point that he take his seat on the judgment seat. He sits on the judgment seat. I am explaining to you why you get intimidated right now. We know that just by searching a little bit Josephus, what was happening at that time in Rome, in Rome. We know that why he gets intimidated this way. You know that by a study of Rome at that time in the first century. Pontius Pilate got his job as a procurator because of one of his friends called Sejanus. He got the job of a procurator because of his friend Sejanus. Sejanus behind me was Pilate's friend, both of them were friends together. Saint Janus, this man, became the captain of the Proterian Guard. Proterian Guard. He became the captain of the Proterian Guard. It's a very influential position. When he became the captain of the Proterian Guard, he made a good offer to Pontius Pilate. Said Janus used his influence to get a job for Pilate. It's exactly the same thing that we see today. Said Janus, Said Janus was already having a position of influence, but it was not enough. He conspired against the, Iper the uh, emperor Tiberius. He wanted his job to be the emperor, the top-notch Tiberius. 
He made a conspiracy against this man to get the top in Rome. The conspiracy against Tiberius with this man was discovered. The conspiracy ended up being discovered. And this man here, among some of his, of his friends, got executed. Sejanus got executed. Now, the Roman Senate was investigating everybody that was connected with Sejanus, including Pontius Pilate, not including this, but including Pontius Pilate. He was under investigation. They were investigating everybody, including Pilate. And the last thing that Pilate wants to do is to release somebody that is competition in competition to Caesar. That's why he's intimidated here. That's enough to intimidate him. Okay, now you know the story about that, the story behind. He got his job by Sejanus. Sejanus conspired against this man. They discovered the conspiracy. Sejanus was cooked among some of his friends. And now the Senate was invest investigating everybody, which was probably including a Pontius Pilate, which was one of his friends. Got a little bit shaky, sat down on the judgment sit seat, and he says in verse 14, Behold your king. It's another attempt to release him. Number six. Is it not uh, sarcastic, behold your king? No, he wants to behold your king. He doesn't want to touch him. Doesn't want. And now it's also spoiled by uh, a statement that you know in verse 15, which we have not read right below that paragraph here. They therefore cried out, Away with him, Jesus, away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? You see, he wants to let go. The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Circle that emphat emphatically. What the Jews are doing here? They disown Messiah as being their king. They disown Jesus the Messiah as their king. Keep in mind that he is the Jehovah of the Old Testament, God in flesh. Scriptures, Deuteronomy. seventeen fifteen. They disowned the Messiah as being their king. You can look up, look up Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 15, and Zechariah 11, the full chapter for the price of it, 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah chapter 11, for the price of it, 30 pieces of silver. And they will be turned, they will turn over the king to the end of Caesar here. And now there is no more attempt to release Jesus. Matthew verse 24, right in the middle of the page, here, bottom of the page 224 and the chunk of it in the page 225 come. So when Pilate saw that he prevailed, nothing didn't work out, but rather that the tumult was arising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, circled up, <clears throat> washing the hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this righteous man. Circle the righteous man. So he washed his hands in Matthew 24, assuming himself that it will basically absolve his guilt. But it does not. Washing his hands meaning I'm not guilty. That's what he thought, though, but he is guilty. Pilate? Yes. Now I'm providing a bit of explanation here. From a human viewpoint, write that down, from a human level, 
human standpoint, Pilate had the final decision. It's human, horizontal level. Pilate had the final decision. It was not up to the Jewish leaders, but up to this one man. He knew, Pontius Pilate, what the right decision was. He knew what the right decision was to release the man. But he called the wrong decision. So merely washing his hand does not take away his guilt. Merely washing his hand does not take away his guilt. That's why you have what you call, what we call in Christianity, the Apostles' Creed. In Acts chapter 3, verse 13, the sermon of Peter, Pontius Pilate is to perdition. In 36 AD, in 36 AD, Pilate was deposed by Cal uh, Ca or C. Caligula. He was deposed of his function by Caligula. He was sent to Gaul in France. And he committed suicide. Pontius Pilate was deposed of his position by Caligula. He was sent to Gaul and he committed suicide. One of the guilty of the greatest wrong of all time, as it is written in New Harmony. Also in Matthew verse 25, verse 24 rather, I ask you to circle of the blood of this righteous man. Circled out. This is the fifth declaration of innocency. This is the fifth declaration of innocency, by far the most important, because it's made from the judgment seat. Now, I'm going to let you finish your note. Let's read Matthew 25. When it says, I am innocent of the blood of this righteous man, see you to it. And all the people, that's the Jews, answered and said, His blood be on us and, our, in, and, our, mm, and on our children. Circle that. Circle that answer here. Yeah, but you will see Matthew in a moment. It's very logical to have that kind of statement. So they are taking upon themselves the curse of his blood, of the blood of Christ. But it's limited to them, the leadership of Jesus' day. Make your notes carefully here. It's limited to them. The leadership like this, the Pharisees of Jesus' day, and upon their children. Which year are we right now? What is the year right now? So AD 30 plus one generation, 40. So who is guilty? Their, their generation and their children, because in AD 70, the city will be wiped out. So the fall, indeed, the fulfillment of it fell upon their children, because 40 years later, the city was destroyed, and the temple was destroyed. The reason why I'm so emphatic on this is simply not to, to, to fall into the mistake done centuries ago by Roman Catholicism, who accused the Jews of all time to have killed Jesus. 
Okay? It's only this generation and their children after that. Subsequent generation of the Jews are not guilty of it. The temple was burned down. Jerusalem was destroyed. And then you have what follows called the diaspora. A technical word for the Jews living outside the land. A major diaspora. Luke verse 24. At the middle of your page 225. And Pilate gave sentence that what they ask for should be done. So Pilate issue right now the death sentence. And in Luke 25, and he released him that for insurrection and murder had been cast into prison, whom they asked for, but Jesus he delivered, delivered up to their will. So they release Barabbas. And once again, it's a beautiful, beautiful message. It's a symbolic substitution. Symbolic substitution. What does it mean? It means exactly this. The innocent one died so that the guilty could go free. That's exactly what happened to you and I. He died for my sin and your sin. He died so that I may go free. Let's be thankful for that. And in John 16, then therefore he delivered him unto them, you circle, to be crucified. Place your finger, on, not on the harmony right now, on your outlines. We reach point four, the mockery. Turn in page 226, paragraph 162. It's a short paragraph to take. Paragraph 162. We're going towards the end slowly. Paragraph 162, top of the page 226 only. Let's read, circle a few things. Let's read only from Matthew. We are into number four, the mockery, paragraph 162. Take time to make your notes. We have lots of time. We, go, we do well. We read. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the palace and gathered unto him the whole band. So called the whole band. It's your famous cohort. They stripped Jesus and put on him a scarlet robe and they plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and a, re and a reed in his right hand. So called the reed in his right hand. And they kneeled down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat upon Jesus and took the reed and smote him on the head. Circle, smiting him on the head. In paragraph 162, here he is turned back to the Roman soldiers. He is Jesus. This is your fourth mockery. In Matthew 27, the band will be used for the crucifixion. Don't ask me how many, probably not 600 people, but those of the band, the cohort, will now be used to crucify Jesus. Part of the band, if not all, to keep the security going and so on, will be used to crucify Jesus. In verse 19 of Mark, we play with Mark and Matthew, it's the same thing anyway, you have the fifth mistreatment suffered of that night. Uh, it's in Mark, because the verse 19, it's not in, in Matthew, it's, it's in Mark. On the other side, there is no 19 in Matthew. What do they take from 
Uh, the, the, they smote in his head. That's it. But I, I, you can go either way with Matthew or verse 30. Here I have in my note, I, I pick Mark. And I'm sending you back to Matthew right away. The read here, it's to imitate a wild scepter, a bat baton, okay? And they smote him on the head and so on. They use him to smite him on the head. That's it. Exactly. The fifth, the fourth mockery and the fifth mistreatment. We're done with that, by the way. Take a deep breath. We're doing exceedingly good. Now we come to here. Take your outlines with you for now. The procession to Calvary. The, prophet, the procession to Calvary, that's what you go, guys call sometimes the Via de la Rosa. We'll go from capital D right here and look straight down to capital G, the ceiling of the tomb and everything in between. All right. We start in paragraph 63. You have it already. Okay. What I did in my own harmony, because we need to study 32 stages of it. Everywhere I have my numbers. Number one, two, three, four, and five as you, throw, as you turn the page. So we will, in this it's a parallel account. I don't give the passage. I give only the verse. You are used already. You're used to their harmony. It's, it's going to go well. In that section, I'm just, just on the introduction of it right now. We begin in paragraph 163. Straight down to 168. I just showed that to you. So it goes from D. To capital G and we will study that those online with 32 distinct stages every time I will name the, the stage number one two and three some will be long some will be short and we comment accordingly so you mean in cadet not only in 163 paragraphs 32 stages no it's in five paragraphs correct and I will tell you each paragraph which stages it contains. If you follow me perfectly carefully, it's going to be good. And this is the exact chronology of the suffering, the Via de la Rosa. So some will have more comments, some will have less comments, but it's chronological here. A.T. Robertson did a good job. So we start. In paragraph 163, you have the first five of 32. I will not let you down. I will be very explicit and repetitious and redundant. We take number one. I will tell you where to go. John, verses 16 and 17, page 226 on the right. We don't read anything else than what I say. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing the cross for himself. Circle out bearing the cross for himself. You will like it. May God bless you. You will like it. Another 10 minutes and we pause. This is standard Roman procedures. Why you don't want to read Mark and Matthew when they it's, say they marked him, took off his robe? No, because we, we already dealt with that. Now we move into the 32 stages to give it chronologically. Keep in mind that the Mark Matthew are not chronological. Now we take the expression that goes with the chronology here. They already mocked him and so on. Okay? So I would like you to stay concentrated on, I'm asking you otherwise the stage will be hard to follow. Okay? We go chronological here. So carrying the cross is standard Romans procedure. The victim is responsible to carry his own cross to the crucifixion site. But most of the time, it's not what you see carrying the big cross like this on the shoulder. Yes, it's on the shoulder, but you only basically carry the cross beam. That part. When you are sentenced to death, to death by means of crucifixion, you're not supposed to scourge the victim prior to this. 
You're not supposed to scourge the victim. It's either or, not both. Remember that he was scourged by means of compromise, by Pilate, Pilate making an attempt to release him. After the scourge, the body of Jesus was weakened, tremendously weakened, and he was only able to go that far. Because you know that he is all bloody and pulpy. This is done for number one. Stage number two, you go to Mark verse 21, left-hand side. And the compelled one passing by, you circle Simon of Cyrene, coming from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, circle Alex and Rufus, to go with them, that he might bear the cross. Simon of Cyrene, of course, it's not his last name, Cyrene is located in North Africa. He was a Jew from there. What is he doing there? It's easy. He came to celebrate the Passover. As you know, it's impossible to lodge the people within the walls of the city. It's too big of a pilgrimage. So outside the walls of the city, they were erecting big tents to lodge the people outside of the wall. Ten cities were erected for them to stay, people like Cyrene. And lots of people were coming there to observe the Hagega, the sacrifice offered by the priests and so forth, to see the smoke going up from the altar and so on. And that's when and where he was compelled to carry the cross of Jesus. I'm talking about Simon of Cyrene. Uh, forced to, or having the desire to, compelled, okay? Only Mark, verse 21, mention, mentioned that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Do you remember to whom Mark wrote? Correct. Mark Rome wrote to the Roman audience. And Paul, the apostle, mentions the same family in Romans chapter 16, verse 13. Paul, the apostle, in his letter to the Romans... Chapter 16, verse 13, the salutation mentions the family, Alexander and Rufus. Because the situation here of carrying the cross led to the salvation of Simon of Cyrene. We have no way of knowing why he became a believer. But it very well might be the case based upon what I explained to you right now. By reading accounts of crucifixion for different people than Jesus. Okay? Make your notes about that. The condemned person to carry his cross and so forth, they were allowed to curse and scream at their tormentors, at the Roman soldiers. They were allowed to scream and curse them. Sometimes the cursing and the swearing got so bad that in order to stop it, they were cutting off their tongue. 
But don't ask me if Jesus were cursing and swearing at his tormentors, so that's probably why Simon of Cyrene clued in that he was the Messiah. He was led to slaughter without cursing and swearing, observing a, different in, a difference in behavior. That's probably what led Simon of Cyrene to say, this man is different here. Remember one thing, the providence of God once again. The church of Rome, to whom the letter of Romans was given, was not founded by an apostle. Paul did not plant the Roman church, the church of Rome. Nor Peter, not founded by apostle. But by Jews that migrated to Rome, including this Simon here. So the stage two of the Via della Rosa has long-term consequences for the first century church. So you mean this Simon of Syria? Would have been a church planter, one of the Jews that believe instituted the Church of Rome. Uh -huh. That's it. So that incident of Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross. And what I'm blown away with that you should also online be blown away with why recorded in, in Mark? Mark wrote to the Romans. So this is a point of detail that the Roman citizen would be just excited to see. Again, you see how spectacular are the gospel accounts. Five more minutes. No, no, not right now. Number three, the lament over Jerusalem. Number three, the lament over Jerusalem, you go to verses 27 to 31 on page 227. Page 227, 27 to 31. Let's read and make... Oh, we have time to take this one. We have time? No, that's okay. It goes... We have 42 minutes already. After the pause, we come back. Thank you.